Hi. Okay, so now we are on live for YouTube. Uh, and then please go ahead, uh, Horizon. Okay. Uh, thank you for opening the, this uh, uh, uh I forget the, the correct name, the but the Gloria Structures the uh, presentation. Uh, today uh, we have the three uh, presenter in uh, this meeting. Uh, the first presenter is the uh, Professor Tatsuya Daikoku from Tokyo University. Is it correct, right? I don't think so, but it, it's okay, no problem. Uh, wait, I, I think uh, the first first person is probably Keisuke. Ah, Keisuke-san, okay. Yeah. Sure. Sorry. So again, so the, yeah, let's start the, the today's meeting. And the first presenter is the uh, Professor Keisuke Suzuki from uh, Hokkaido University chain. And uh, uh, so we'd, we'd like to start the Keisuke-san's talk. So please go ahead. Uh, okay, I'll share my screen. Uh, by the way, just to give a reminder, uh, each talk is 15 minutes and uh, followed by 15 minutes of the discussion. Okay. okay. Thanks. So shall I start? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you for inviting me for this meeting. And uh, yeah, I'm Keisuke Suzuki from Hokkaido University. I belong to the Center for Human Nature, Artificial Intelligence and Neuroscience which recently um, became a permanent organization. So yeah, hopefully you guys at some point can visit us. Okay. Uh, so I just start with my uh, like uh, self-introduction. So I'm working mainly on virtual reality and consciousness science, but also I'm originally from artificial life, so computational um, simulation stuff. And um, I've been working on like bodily self interception uh, rubber hand illusion type of stuff using virtual reality before, but recently I'm also working on like computational uh, modeling uh, to to simulate like more phenomenological property of hallucination or delusion is not yet coming, but yeah, hallucination or depersonalization stuff like that. And I did actually my uh, um, bachelor with in physics, and then I moved to uh, artificial life, and I'm doing the PhD and then moved to virtual reality, consciousness, science, and now I continue to do this kind of stuff in, yeah, in Hokkaido University. So that's uh, just a brief summary. And actually, I know a lot of people in this, uh, the the project, um, including the Matsuda-san or Ikeyama-san. Okay, so this is a new project. Today, I'm uh, talking about um, inner speech. Um, and this is the, the project uh, collaborated with two other guys I will introduce later. The, the first thing I uh, want to just introduce is this inner speech. You know, like this is just a comic, like manga. Sometimes we have this kind of text, but I, I, I don't know. I never actually met anyone, but some people actually don't understand this, uh, you know, text, but which is not actual, you know, someone's uh, um, external voice, but looks like, a, you know, like a self monologue. But because some people actually don't have this kind of, you know, linguistic monologue in, in their mind. So they don't understand what, what this actually means, where, where this voice is coming from. Is it from like actual narration or something? So it looks like there's a lot of uh, like uh, diversity about for people's internal speech, or maybe it's more like precisely saying it's internal thought process. And I think that's a kind of our like main, like, uh, the goal to investigate to 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 pursue in this project. So, for example, yeah, when you when you for example think about oh, it's just a kind of you know again monologue or inner speech. When you think about I want money, some people really visually dominate, like uh, people visualize the actual image of money. But some other people actually you know more like like a bubble, but even a bubble uh, type of people. Some people is more like a written text, some others more spoken language. So even like your language based in 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 a internal monologue has a different form. Um, yeah, and of course, um, there are a lot of study were on uh this internal. I, I just use inner speech in this context. 
And I think they uh, like uh, gain more like uh, uh, attention for this inner speech recently. I think uh, I found other like uh, what is called some uh, internet forums that are discussing about how people have a different um, type of in, in, internal state of uh, speech. Um, uh, I just uh, go, going a little bit background of the inner speech in this, uh, like uh, psychology. For example, like a lot of uh, psychologists or you know philosopher addressing ab about this. For example, like a Piaget or uh, Vygotsky, the Russian psychologist. They uh, all talk about this kind of you know inner speech is how how these inner speech develop in a childhood. For example, Pia Piaget said inner speech is first um formed first person way and then it's uh, uh transferred into like external speech whereas Vygotsky says opposite way so maybe first people acquire language in a, like a social uh pressure or social norm and then it's actually into internalized to people's in inner speech so yeah they're the two different view like uh, which like the inner speech first or external speech first or other discussion uh like Skinner, Bigoski, or you know, a lot of study on this kind of uh, inner speech. But apparently, these are study mainly focus on language or linguistic birth, uh, linguistic aspect of the inner speech. So, there, I'm not going to to detail of the this uh, each person the theory, but mainly they're talking about like how how inner speech is different from uh, our explicit language, for example, like uh, maybe they have a different grammatical construct or you know structure. Or you know some people use a uh, certain vocabulary more in the inner speech stuff like that. But this is like really lingu linguistics oriented approach. Um, maybe something is uh, closer closest to our like theory is more like a visualizer verbalizer type of um what's called like a co cognitive uh personality or characteristics. So people have a different um um attitude to your like uh inner like thought so this uh, study is um discriminate categorize three different type of people like visualizer or barber barberizer or spatial barberizer again like uh yeah i think you we can actually categorize this kind of stuff many many you know uh, different way like arbitrarily but um yeah i i, I don't know we are you know that these three categories enough maybe it's not so we are first uh, want to study like how these internal, um, how diverse actual, actually people have in this kind of inner speech. So our project is basically uh, consists of the three different objects. First is um, try to investigate this diversity of inner speech using uh, like online survey method. And then we are going to, based on this, uh, the first um, part of the project, we are going to make, uh, create some kind of uh, artwork for people to experience different type of inner speech, or you can actually uh, communicate with other people, or, or maybe we intervene people's inner speech with virtual reality or other like media technology. And then finally, we will uh, develop kind of new behavior or physiological measure to, um, to characterize people's inner speech or yeah again it's maybe not just speech but yeah the diversity of their in a kind of mental state or mental process so our team so me as a uh pi i'm i'm a like xr ai cogsci guy but i'm also uh having one guy from osaka university um hideyuki takashi he's a um psychology guy also do, uh, working a lot on HCI, human computer, human agent interface stuff. And also we have uh, Makino-san, who is an artist in Kyushu University. So this is our team. And research plan, it's basically uh, um, aligned to our three objects. So the first we are create, we are going to create uh, some kind of a online app or online site for people can report their inner speech like a regular base, you know, day by day. So we did already, I, I will explain a bit more, uh, some background, uh, like pre preliminary results we already have. But uh, uh, for this project, um, we're going to do more like comprehensive research uh, survey for the inner speech using new type of, um, um, I'll say, the 
type A method. And then um, based on the object two, we are creating an interactive experiential art piece for using uh, for intervene in inner speech, inter interfere or interact with the inner speech using the virtual reality and other things. And yeah, the first uh, last part of the project is uh, creating the experiment and execute experiment. So how much do we have? Okay, maybe five another five minutes. So we already did. Uh, so okay, first part we tried to use empirical sampling method for this uh, um, online survey. So uh, empirical sampling is basically uh, it's not just one shot one of our uh, questionnaire data, but instead we are kind of using a smart app or whatever method to push people to you know report their um ongoing sort or way of perceiving in like a, a problem times in the day for example and get a lot of uh, you know different answer based on their occasion or you know like maybe people have a different way of thinking when you're working or when you're you know shopping or whatever so this could make a more like a detailed um data for even one person maybe have a different type of uh, in a speech for each day so we did already uh um some uh survey using uh, actually the twitter which is uh, actually conducted by a uh, uh, hideman fan before so that actually you can see like uh, in, in a internet forum people already start talking about you know sharing their like on internet in, in a speech and you know found very interesting to other people with different type of in a speech so in this preliminary study uh this is just a, again one shot uh, online survey so people are watching this kind of we have a okay we don't have a word but you, you know like a we first show some uh, situation, like for example, this one, like someone lost their wallet and uh, you know need to find the wallet. So you, you have some kind of thought in this kind of situation or like selecting what to eat for lunch. So you need to, you know, con confederate something. It's more like a deliber deliberate deliberation process. And uh, we also, oh sorry, we already and we uh, also, this is kind of, uh, it's not uh, what's it called, uh, forced choice, but we show the different type of, you know, in, in uh, speech. Some of them is actually, uh, um, sorry, some are more like a visually, but more like a graph oriented, you know, like a flow chart base, or some, uh, some example is like a pure visual or speech, speech, but the two voice, you know, two person, like a dialogue type of uh, inner speech or monologue type of inner speech. So people can actually uh, select as much as you want. You know, maybe some people have a two or three different type of inner speech symptom. So we found uh, some interesting uh, correlation between between you know like some uh, people are uh, reporting the spoken language as inner speech. They also have a uh, uh, written language inner speech. You know, these two um, type of inner type sorry two type of inner speech people are like a co co corresponding each other, whereas the visual and, uh, visual and the spoken language have less correlate each other. So, you know, like there's some correlation between them. And yeah, I will maybe skip some of them. And interestingly, some people have more like multimodal um, inner speech, like uh, some people even use, I think the majority is still a visual or auditorial, but some people, some people even have a tactile or like a, what's called olfactory sense when when you when they have an inner in, a, in a speech which it's kind of difficult to understand but yeah that's a that's a point of the um this project because yeah i think it's kind of similar to to me like this kind of synesthesia you know people don't recognize how how your private um world of your mind is different from other people so yeah we also have some uh, uh anecdotal like a free text based response from this but i'll skip this one so this is the first part of the project, and then we move to the this uh, art work, which we haven't yet started anything, but if we have some uh, initial idea. For example, this is a simple augmented reality uh, demo, but you can see like uh, uh, the text is free superimposed into the real world, and what what if you can actually interact? You know, if you if you see this kind of uh, text which might be, you know, intervene your 
internal salt or not. So it's kind of, you know, from this part to the last part of the project, creating the behavioral measure is kind of continuous. And there's uh, some other interesting game. Sorry, it's so there's a video game called this Hello Blade Sensor that I never actually play, but some uh, one of my friends uh, taught me this video game. This is just normal, like a first person, you know, uh, like action game. But the, meanwhile, you play in the game, you actually hear a lot of a voice, like designed as like a, a auditory hallucination. And uh, I think team is also, you know, the game developer had a, you know, some uh, psychiatry as a, like an advisor. So it's kind of interesting. People start thinking, you know, their thought is inserted or influenced by the external voice. So this is something we want to do in this project. So the last part is, yeah, again, the, using this kind of intervention method using VR or auditorial um, VR, we try to create a behavioral measure of this. So there's actually already Richard Feynman physicists uh, discuss and uh, even try to do some uh, simple experiment by himself. So he found himself when he count a number, um, he can do it easily even without even while he's reading the text. But he found it's impossible to count when someone talking. You know, so it's basically his. Uh, counting process is very, very like auditorial based. Whereas his uh, friend and the colleague doing the opposite, you know, he can actually um, count without, uh, sorry, he can count while someone talking, but he cannot do it while he's reading some text. So he actually do some, he did some simple experiment, you know, like sometimes people, um, how much you, you know, when you do some simple mental tasks like accounting, how much that influenced by the external stimuli. So that's something we are um, going to be based on. So that's a kind of all three project we are trying to do. So I just last, this is almost last slide. Um, I just talking about some in, uh, significance and impact in society. So the currently, like we have only in a speech, but we don't really realize, you know, we have how diverse we have in this in, inner internal. Uh, space of mind. So we're gonna make um, society more like accepting this richness or diversity of the inner in speech by sharing or, you know, uh, communicating with the people having a different type of inner speech. So that's a uh, kind of overall goal of this project. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. That's excellent presentation. And so, yeah. Uh, I'd like to ask the any question, the comment. So, if there are any audience have the question, the comment. So please turn on mic and ask him. Yes. Can I ask question? Oh, yes, please. Yes. Yes. Um. I was wondering why that um individuality was a uh, difference um strategy of inner speech arise to each people and uh, some developmental bias of some sort i mean what wh why people have different yeah yeah that's a i mean interesting question i i like my collaborator takashi san always said like that's natural people have been different internal thought but because we use language we need to assume everyone everyone has a similar mindset, but it's, that's actually an illusion, maybe. You know. We actually have totally different way of thinking, or it, it's actually going to be like a career problem, but you know. But because of the language, maybe we are we we are not very aware. We are we don't need to be aware of this diversity, but maybe it might be just the in nature it's diverse. I, I don't know the answer, by, by the way. Okay, and also when you're dreaming, mm. are you using in, inner speech when you're dreaming? Uh, yeah, I think that dreaming is really interesting as well. I feel people uh, have a visual, visual inner speech. They normally have more visually oriented dream. You know, I think it's related with, because both it's like a, some kind of, um, I'll say, 
how will you imagine the world in Burberry or imagine like imagery or other ways? So I think experiencing the dream is also something I want to ask people. If, if, I think some people like you know people sometimes I, I, also I didn't actually uh, mention, but this is also related with the a fantasia people who doesn't have any mental imagery. Mm -hmm. I heard that the two percent of population doesn't have any visual imagery. And those people don't have a dream with images. Just uh, I don't I I cannot uh, imagine how it's right. But people describe the dream as a just a series of story or something. So yeah, I think that's interesting to see the difference or similarity between the dream imagery. Thank you. Okay. So and the one audience. Uh, raise the hand. So please ask your question, the comment. Yeah. Um, uh, okay. I I have a question. Um, uh, from me. Hello. Uh, so Suzuki san, Kesuke san. Hi. So Hi. uh, is uh inner speech uh the inner inner speech sounds a little bit uh, more cognitive, but the uh, inner sound, mm. you know, the the feeling of the music played in the uh, uh, brain or sort of the in consciousness, uh, is it sort of related to inner speech uh, type or is it not correlated? Uh, are you going to investigate that as a part of the questionnaire? Yeah, I, th I think that's another thing, yeah. I, I feel, yeah, I think some people, um, I don't know, like, uh, uh, yeah, again, this is maybe a bit uh, out of this uh, project, but I think inner speech is really uh, interlinked with, for example, schizophrenia people have, you know, auditory hallucination. People hear the voices, but some say that's actually their own internal voice, you know, in a speech, but they, they recognize it as a, the sound from, a, uh, recognize as external sound. So I think that's also really interesting. Some people um, can have how much, you know, like, a, how pe like people hearing this kind of uh, illusion or hallucination of the voice, do they have also in a voice as a linguistic or not, spoken language? Or That's a maybe interesting question to ask. Yeah, I, I thought that, you know, they if there is some kind of dissociation or correlation, it may be also interesting to look into the neural basis and uh, hmm. it's, uh, you know, the candidate correlate will be kind of, you know, narrowed down. So uh, like in left hemisphere or right hemisphere or something like that. Yeah. That's why I kind of suggested that. I see. Great. Okay. Morikusa. So, yeah, yeah Morikusa. It's not so interesting to talk. So it's a very naive question, but uh, bilingual people have some kind of different type of uh, internal language, mm. or uh, they, I don't know, different type of uh, inner language depending on, on the language. So there's some, some some kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah I, 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 I. I... I, I think so, yeah. I mean, I, I'm not bilingual, but after living in the UK, like 10 years, I start, you know, I, I first start dreaming in English, for example. So, mm. and I don't know, especially like some people, uh, bilingual people say when they think, you know, in scientific context, people tend to use, for example, English or at least like, mm. your, your own language. So. Yeah, I think that's a, another interesting point. Yeah, um, and maybe add that as an additional question. How, yeah, if, if someone has a two language, if someone can speak two language, how, how the, which language they actually use in, in that speech is really interesting. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Okay. Are there any comment or question? Um, can I ask you? Yeah. Uh... Um, uh, hi, uh, Keske san. Um, I just want to ask is there a difference in the quality of the audio? For example, sometimes we have in the uh, monologue, we hear our own sound, but I assume that's not true for everybody. And sometimes people report um, the sound is echoing or lingering in, yeah. in their head. So I just want to ask um, have you investigated 
investigated the quality mm. of the uh, the monologue. Yeah, that's something. Yeah, it's more like a like low level found the future might be. Yeah, another thing. So I want to we want to uh, investigate. So um, um, yeah. One of our collaborators, Makino Sana, start using some, uh, you know, deep deep neural network to convert the audio. But you know, using this kind of technique, we can actually use your own voice. You know, you you hear someone's voice, but you can create your own voice version. So, or you know, maybe it's maybe more technically difficult, but I I maybe in ultimately we want to create a device. You know, you can hear voice, but as if I mean, sounds sounds like it's your own voice, you know, like uh, taking over your inner voice by uh, external device. Then maybe we can uh, compare, you know, how 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 much that similar or or you know how much it interfere your own internal thought. So yeah, we're actually thinking maybe you know this inner inner speech should be similar to your own voice or or at least the owner thing for the voice might be a. Uh, important to implement yes thanks and uh, ishara san please go ahead yeah thanks uh ksk that's uh, really interesting um so my question is sometimes in inner speech there are these kind of more higher order reflective types of you know thought like i'm i'm thinking this and that but there are also more kind of um non-reflective thoughts right where we just say yeah. like or akire. and those are for me quite interesting because there's not yet you can't say there are my thoughts but at the same time descriptively there's not yet a distinction between me and the kind of object yeah. um so in, in nishida's terms it would be more like a junsuike and pure experience type so I was wondering if you 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 might be like if you're going I, to be looking into those kind of experiences as well. Yeah, that's something really interesting as well. I feel, especially this kind of a you know study when you answer this question, you you normally use your like a memory, you know, like yeah. I I might mm. have had a way to think before, so I answer this way. But as you said. Maybe when you actually have it, you know, right after, it might not be even your voice or it might not even categorize as a visual or lang linguistic or you know, just, a, as you said, just a pure experience, maybe. So that's why we want to do this kind of a sampling uh, process, uh, try to ask people immediately after their mm. process. I don't know, mm. it, it still maybe when you inter interpret your experience, you... Yeah, yeah I, this is there is some difficulty when you interpret. It's already you start, you know, uh, monitoring your mind. So uh, this is related <laughs> with more like a phenomenological approach, or you know, um, yeah. So yeah, well, uh, some people in the chain we are using some uh, start using this micro phenomenological interview um, approach. So. Yeah, that's something we also need to look 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 into. You know, like how to how to actually measure or how to capture the the people's experience more precisely. All right, mm. All right, yeah, interesting. Thank you. And the next uh, SOE US. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just on this press, please. Oh, uh, hi. Thank you for your presentation, and I I want to ask or uh, clarify the uh, inner speech. You said that there are three types of inner speech, right? And then uh, there's a one type of inner speech is uh, like visual, visual kind of thing. So can I understand um, understand that uh, the, the words inner speech is the uh, linguistic expression of raw experience? Can I understand like that? Yeah, I don't know the answer. Um, yeah, as I said, as I the, in my answer to the um, uh, Ishara san, it might be, you know, some people. I mean, recognize your own thought as a language because we uh, tend to do this. But yeah, it's, it's uh, maybe it's a bit difficult how how much they actually reflect their 
experience. But at least, you know, like uh, we we clearly show the different type of um um like so for 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 now the in our previous uh experiment we just use some kind of you know uh, animations to to de describe the different type of inner thought in a speech. Um so yeah we assume you know when people say my uh, inner speech is like actual visual it means visual but when when they they when they say li linguistic yeah that that's a bit difficult to say is it actual linguistic or it's a direct you know they they have something but they interpret as a language but I, yeah that, that's i want to discuss with your guys at some point you know that's maybe a really common um problem for this field of research uh, thank you thank you for your answering and then another following question is uh, follow to now like neural basic of the uh, inner sieve. so if i have visual inner uh, inner speech so my neural activity will be on my visual cortex or another cortex like that yeah i, I kind of imagine so and yeah that's something interesting to see i heard like a kamitani san in uh, in kyoto university he start using the auditorial uh decoding as well you know he he did already the visual uh reconstruction using the um what's called MR, fmri data using just the uh, you know, computational decoding paradigm and he start using like the auditorial cortex as well to reconstruct the audio audio signal so you know that that kind of approach maybe can be combined with our research to investigate which part of the brain actually associate with the inner in inner thought, and it will be really interesting. People have a different um brain pattern based on their type of inner inner speech. Yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Okay, so now it's a time to stop the uh Suzuki San's talk. So thank you, thank you for the exam. And uh, yeah, we want to move to the next the presentation. And uh, I'd like to uh, ring the bell on the 20 minutes and ring the two bell on the 50 minutes. It's uh, just the end of the, the presenter's talk. And uh, finally, so I ring the bell uh, on the uh, 30 minutes. And the second talk is uh, from the uh, Okanoya-san uh, from Tokyo University. Uh, the title is the Integrated Korea's uh, Basis of the Naming is Social uh, Animals. So please go ahead. Yes, um, my name is Kazuo Okanoya. I know some of you here, like Keisuke or daigo -san and Tsujiya-san, and I'm very happy to be able to join this group to pursue my very, very long lasting interest. Um, I named this integrated Korea as this uh, Korea of somebodyness in a social setting is formed through multimodal interaction with that person. Like I know Keisuke uh, from the well, I don't know. Is it fifteen years ago? Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe that one. Yeah. 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 From a long time ago, and I know his um voice. I know his face, although he got a bit older than before. It's I can still uh, I can start still imagine his face when I hear his voice and his uh voice when I see his face like this. So, um. Multi-model social interactions might form a colia of that person. That integrated colia might be a basis of naming. This is my idea. So I use Bird Society. My project aims to find such integrated colia in a group of birds that use both auditory and visual modalities in their communication. I will measure behavioral and neural similarity between individuals in a group, and I will use a social cross-modal oddball task 
to obtain integrated qualia. This is what I would like to do, and this is a demonstration of Bengali's Finch Society social measurement. This is courtesy of Genta Toya, my collaborator. Okay, there are three birds, well, making sounds like, <laughs> like this, and they are interacting like that, and uh, this is their individual distances, and this is times of approaches to each of those. Okay, looks fun. So by using this kind of social metal, I can sort of see what's going on in these guys' society. Then I would like to establish social cross-model oddball task. Um, this is like this, habituation with bird number one's call, like and you also see sometimes bird number one's face like this, right? And then you uh, present bird number two's call or face, okay? Assuming bird, bird number one's voice activates the representation of number one's face, seeing bird number two's face would cause this habituation. So in more uh, experimental term, we do habituation tasks like F1, face one, face one, voice one, face one, face one, voice one, and so on. Then when uh, the subject or bird is habituated to this bird number one's face and voice, then we do this habituation, V1, voice one, voice one, and face two, voice one, voice two, like this. We think this should work in an established group of social animals. And that integrated qualia uh, will be like this, okay? See, this is social and public, and this is social relations in real world. And each of these words should have auditory qualia for A and B, C, and emotional qualia for A and B and C, and vision visual quality for A and B and C. And these are actually not like separated qualia. It's probably integrated as a qualia directed to this specific bird or that specific bird. That is integrated representation of uh, the qualia, see? Then uh, we can construct integrated qualia. This is a subjective uh, representation. This is a uh, neural brain representation of integrated uh, qualia. And we also can get behavioral representation, subjective representation of integrated qualia of a society like this. And my specific aims are first, predict the social behavior of the Finch group based on the multimodal similarity data. Then second, uh, establish an alignment between behavioral similarity measures and the neural similarity measures. And finally, establish a cross-model audible procedure for both behavioral and neural measures to uh, approach integrated qualia. Okay, these are specific games. And about behavior, um, I see this is years ago. This is like, I don't know, this is like 30 years ago, very, very long time ago. I already did this kind of experiment. Um, birds are trying to pick one bottom as long as one sound continues, like beep, 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 beep. Then bird picks one bottom like this. Then the, when sound changes, like beep, boop, beep, boop, beep, then the bird would change different button here, okay? Then the bird gets rewarded, okay? If this P and PO is um, very different, it is easy for birds to detect the difference. Then he will pack the key B very quickly. But if P and PO is quite similar, then it's quite difficult to 
detect the change. So it would take longer time to pick the key here. So um, with an experiment with a set of different pitch sounds, we found that when frequency difference is larger, the reaction time is shorter and vice versa. Therefore, we can use reaction time to detect sound change correspondence to cognitive similarity of the sound stimuli. And we can use multimodal, no, multi-dimensional multi scaling uh, the, the, to construct the structure of cognitive space for auditory stimuli in this bird. So we, um, I did this experiment about 30 years ago. Uh, these are uh, calls, these are sonograms of Bajariga. Bajariga is a small part. Bajariga calls sounds like like this, uh, different individ individuals. And these are zebra finch calls, you know, zebra finch is a small gray bird and goes like these calls, okay? So uh, suppose we play a call B as a background many times, then switch this background to either call A or C or D and measure reaction time. So the reaction time is the measure of dissimilarity, okay? So we can use inverse of reaction time as measure of similarity to construct multi-dimensional space. This is a result of uh, multi-dimensional scaling of reaction times in Bajarigas and zebra finches. These are different birds. And you see in, um, for Bajarigas, Bajarigas calls are very differentiated and zebra finch calls are clustered. And for zebra finches, zebra, zebra finch calls are differentiated and Bajariga calls are clustered like this. This is um, very much as expected because Bajarigas should be able to tell the difference among Bajariga calls, but they don't care about zebra finch calls and vice versa in zebra finches. Okay. Oh. Then, well, because Dicoxan is here, I show a little bit of the, uh, this data. Uh, we were able to obtain pitch chroma of birds. Um, pitch chroma is when you hear uh, different pitches, you construct the chromatic uh, circle like this. And also your uh, chromatic circle is in your mind internally um, going up like this as the height go up. Okay, and uh, from what is our oh, Bengalese finches, we can get the circular uh, chroma. So this is like humans like this. And for zebra finches, we got something like this. I don't know what this is, but, but maybe if you see from this side, it's like this, right? So um, it, it is as if Bengalese finches are watching this chroma scale uh, uh, from the above, it's circular. And zero finches watching this, uh, listening this chroma scale from uh, the side. So this is interesting. We can measure behavioral similarity like this. And we can also measure uh, visual similarity of faces, I think. And this is very different experiment in which we trained uh, these fringes, Bengalese fringes, to discriminate between the front face and side face, right? And by operant conditioning. And we show all kinds of different degrees, and we get this kind of uh, generalization gradient when uh, trained from um, front face, uh, they react more to front and less to side. When trying to side face, they react more to side face and less to front face. So we can train them to discriminate among faces. So we can um, measure both auditory and visual similarity among social friends in those Bengalese society. Next, about neural correlates. 
uh, there is this very, very tiny little uh, EEG uh, transmitter that I can use for uh, birds. This is 0 0.8 gram, less than one gram. So I can put this EEG transmitter on top of a bird's head, and I was able to get you know, um, sound similarity measure uh, based on this uh, EEG mismatch negativity. Uh, this is a uh, um, um, uh, negativity strength uh, uh, with standard uh, this uh, waveform so voltage is here, but with deviated sound, the voltage goes down because this is mismatch negativity. Okay, with pure tone it occurs, with some element it occurs, with calls it occurs. Therefore, we can use calls to measure uh, similarity among uh, different social calls, right? And we can probably use these kinds of uh, parameter to construct neural um, neural qualia space for face or calls. That's what we would do. And uh, we can do cognitive and, and uh, neural qualia in Bengali's Queen Society and alignment of cognitive and neural uh, representations to understand the social behavior of finches like this. That's, I think, we can do. So uh, for uh, these three specific aims, uh, predict social behavior of the finches group based on the multimodal similarity data, this is tractable and establish an alignment between behavioral similarity measures and neural similarity measures, this is also tractable. Uh, the third point, establish a cross-modal oddball procedure for both behavior and neural measures. This is a big challenge, but I think I can do. This is real challenge. And uh, because it can't get used, this slam dunk, I also use slam dunk. Uh, we have, we are trying many different things like uh, habituation, dishabituation, operant detection, and using natural behavior. And uh, we think some of these should work to do cross model, uh, cross, cross model oddball detection task. And if it works, we are closer to integrated qualia, I hope. And, uh, I am working with these people. Um, we are doing barbecue here. And, uh, and these people will help me to uh, take me to the integrated quarter of bird world. That's all for my talk. Thank you very much. Thank you for organizing. Okay, so let's move to the QA session. And uh, please write your hand in zoom and uh, please ask question the comment okay uh i'll just start uh just get started uh great uh organization um i'm just uh uh kind of worried or interested in whether uh this integrated foria will be preserved under anesthesia or sleep yeah yeah that's quite interesting, and that we could do because um, if you use auditory stimuli, um, I can present auditory stimuli, and there are kinds of anesthesia that makes uh, auditory response intact. That I can do with EEG measures, right? Oh. That's fine. I, I <laughs> Okay, <laughs> this is not a question, right? Okay, okay. So, so I can do that, and also I learned from my colleague in in Germany that he is uh, anesthetizing bird, and he is making the eye open, mm. and he sometimes put eye medicine so that eye doesn't get dry, and he could present the visual stimuli to the anesthetized animal like that. So it is possible to get integrated cholera under anesthesia. And under sleeping, um, auditory stimulus is possible to get a cholera. Yes. 
Yeah, but, but the co uh, critical question is whether you would predict uh, if the integrated quota disintegrates oh. under the anesthesia or not. Okay, okay. I think, um, yeah, I'm actually hoping the, uh, it depends on the anesthesia, right? Um, some kind of anesthesia will dissolve, dissolve uh, integrated chorea into pieces. Other kind of anesthesia might preserve integrated chorea, but I will try different kind of anesthesia like isoflurane or uh, Nembutal, and these will act differently to nervous system. That might change the integrated chorea. Okay. That is possible. Yeah, yes. great. Thanks. And uh, uh, Ikeda-san? Yes. Oh, thank you. Uh, I have a question on your EEG device. Yeah. But uh, I understand your device is capturing the neural activity related to the auditory task. But uh, my question is, do you think it can cover the multimodal brain lesion at the same time, including the vision, auditory, and the emotion? Okay, the thing I will do first is I am going to insert the EEG electrode. At, this is actually not exactly EEG, but also local field potential. It's not entire brain, but uh, more local. And I am going to insert the electrode into the integrated area of bird brain, which is called uh, neo, what was it? Neopolium, first medial is lateralis, but it doesn't matter. But anyway, this bird is considered uh, um, analogous or homologous to prefrontal cortex of mammals. So I will try taking a result from this. Yes. Okay. Makes sense. Thank you. Thanks. Are there any comment or question? Oh, okay. So it's just on place, I think. Yeah, so I have a question. I, I found uh, your presentation of like the finding of this sort of spiral uh, when you do this multi-dimensional scaling of um, these pictures and you report like one species of bird sees the spiral or chromacy from like top and then this other species sees it from the side or something. Now I was just wondering, have you, have you or can you confirm that first of all that they do actually perceive some sort of that the chromacy of these tones are actually organized in a spiral shape? Like, for example, if you uh, do multiple, uh, do your MDS uh, to three dimensions instead of two dimensions, then do you still see a spiral? And then the only difference is which dimensions they uh, are. Yeah, yeah, okay. These are not spirals, but the finches and the bajaragas, but it doesn't matter. Okay, anyway, yeah, if I increase dimensionality, there is a, a possibility that uh, will, uh, the, had other species representations become uh, uh, more widespread. It is possible. Uh, but with that particular data, uh, multi-dimensional scaling explained like more than 80% of variance of the data and seeing more higher dimension doesn't make too much difference. But we could certainly do with more complex tasks like current tasks. And when we do integrated Korea experiment with multimodal, cross-modal uh, audible tasks, we probably need to go to higher dimensionality. It's okay. Great, thanks. It's kind of a related uh, question, uh, but uh, about that, the similarity on the so spiral thing, that's very, Surprising and also impressive, but that that was based on the reaction time, right? Yes, it, it is based on reaction time. Yes. Yeah, that's a quite a surprising uh, for us because sometimes, uh, especially especially when we collaborated with uh, uh, Moriguchi san mm -hmm. uh, here uh, to you know usually baby studies are done with uh, reaction time and also looking percentage and things like that, right? Mm -hmm. They 
their data doesn't look very convincingly representing the sparsity mm -hmm. or similarity. So mm -hmm. I'm wondering if uh, bars can also report the similarity <laughs> more directly and then uh, to test whether the reaction time is really great representation of the similarity or not. Um, you know, bars are very serious and <laughs> they are... <laughs> They are very well trained. Uh, uh, they want to go very quickly, as quick as possible in uh, detection tasks, right? So the similarity measure is very reliable in this case. Uh, and, uh, and also we started to look at the visual attention of birds too. And when we use not sound, but faces, we could use eye gaze of uh, birds too. How long do they look at those? And uh, eye gaze in birds is it, very easy to detect because birds have huge eye and they don't move eyes. They move face, <laughs> they move head. So if you measure head uh, direction, we can measure eye gaze. So that we also would do. Mm -hmm. Would it be nice if I can get um eye gaze similarity measure? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I see. Interesting. And do you have any question comment? In terms of that uh, face, uh I mean all of these uh, similarity structures and also uh, behaviors are quite interesting, but uh, also it would be very super interesting if you have uh, some kind of counterintuitive uh, result, like uh, in the case of the human illusion-like situation. And yeah. I'm wondering if uh, birds also perceive the face, uh, which is upside down to uh. be similar to each other or something like that, you know. Yeah. Um, when you make it upside down, suddenly all the faces look, start to become similar or something like that. I think something like that would happen because uh, we have tried an experiment uh, to show face or body and or face and body like that. And birds will, uh, okay, male birds are eager to copulate, right? So male birds will sing to female as a mating uh, behavior, right? Mm -hmm. And if you show uh, live videos, a uh, female face, and then they will sing to it, yeah? But if you make it upside down, they don't sing. Uh -huh. So the upside down face is not face anymore. However, it is also possible to uh, do operant discrimination of right side up face and upside down face. And we can measure similarity in uh, mm, uh, upside down or right side up faces to see whether like uh, such a such, such a illusion occurs in birds or so, yeah. That's very interesting. Then we can also start to align the face yeah. similarity space between the face, uh, human and birds or something. Uh, like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm afraid my uh, work become becoming increasing. So. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Any other comment, question? I think I want to, a comment from daiko san about the pitch chroma data. Um, all right. There are no daiko san no, question about the pitch chroma. Yeah. From, well, yeah. I I'm not uh, grasp the completely, but I think this is uh, related with the absolute pitch and the relative pitch perception, I guess. So because that uh, yeah. is it correct? So I mean, yeah. I, 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 yeah. So I think I think so. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't know how to connect with the uh, theory with that such a um uh, phenomena in the brain. Oh, well, okay. <laughs> sorry. 
Yeah, way. try try to do that, please. Yeah. Okay, so now it's time to stop the Okanaya san's talk. So thank you again for Okanaya san. Thank you very much for listening to my uh, presentation, and I welcome any comments or criticism on my project. Great, thank you. Thanks. Okay. And uh, let's move to the next session. Uh, the today's the final talk is from uh, Tatsuya Daikoku uh, from the University of Tokyo. So please show the please share your slide. Can you okay, see and the, yes, I can see. And the title is to understand the embodied cognition that emerges from a musical Korea. Okay, so Daikoku-san, please go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. Let's start. I'm going to give a talk on my project of Korea structure as a publicly offered research. This is it, right. So firstly, I briefly introduce uh, me. So the important thing is that my name is the Daikoku. It's not Oguro. Okanae-san firstly say to me the Oguro-san <laughs> when we meet the first time. So everyone says so. Many people say so me Oguro-san, but I'm a Daikoku. So please remember today. <laughs> I'm belonging to the University of Tokyo, the Information Science Graduate School of Information Science of Technology. And I also affiliated with the Cambridge University uh to understand uh, to study the language and relationship with language between language and the music okay let's start so this study uh of my project uh tackle question about how sound sound korea i mean auditory korea structure particularly music emerge and are expressed through the embodiment so how, and how cognitive individuality uh, modulates auditory career and whether sound uh, auditory career can be intentionally altered or changed through somatosensory stimulation and somatosensory sharing. So specifically, it tests the two hypotheses. So hypothesis one is the relationship of auditory career structure can be represented by relationship between bodily map and emotional distribution. And the second hypothesis is the uh, cognitive individuality transforms the auditory courier structure related with the bodily map and emotional distribution. So to verify these two hypotheses, I'm going to present my recent study first three related with this topic. So first, we often experience the range of emotion from music such as joy, sadness, and nostalgia. These subjective experience can vary based on culture and error, yet some are universal. For, ex for, for example, research suggests that the major key, <clears throat> uh, cho -cho, uh, generally evoke more positive emotions than minor key across culture. However, the Western music-based preference for consonance over dissonance is not shared by indigenous people of Amazon. Researcher says so that is the wider music cons music consonance and the dissonance that is the degree of frequency ratio is mathematical and linked with cochlear function of the human ear. The preference and evoked uh, preference uh, depends on our fat kind of and how degree of auditory stimuli we have experienced through us our brain's development. Then the question is fat component link. Uh, between music and subject, such as subject of emotion. So to understand this question, my project focuses on brain prediction. Our brain con continuously predicts sensory input drawing on prior experience. Regarding this, the music prediction error elicit physical sensation, uh, such as music chills, that called music chills, or increase in heart rate. These physical sensations can sometimes be expressed, experienced as music pressure, which in turn stimulates the release of dopamine in the brain, a process known as positive reward prediction error. That is, these music-induced physical sensations contribute to embodied cognitive cognition or embodied aesthetic 
a beauty experience of music. For, for example, music syncopation occurs when tone is played at the moment that doesn't align with regular beat timing. This gap between basic beat and actual tone elicits a prediction error, often leading to a behavior impulse to tap our feet or uh, hand to reinforce the beat internalize, beat internalize our brain. Imagine you are listening to this rhythm. At that moment, our brain starts to anticipate the next beat, compelling us to tap along with our feet or hand like this. The typical beat. <clears throat> this action brand our own tapping sound with actual rhythm sound that can be interpreted that the brain try to reduce the pre perceptive uncertainty of rhythm and making temporal prediction easier by active inference, leading to music enjoyment and brain rewards thanks to reduction prediction error. The important thing is that such active inference are less likely to occur when rhythm are over complex. This is because expressively complex rhythm make it difficult to resolve prediction error, even with active inference. In other words, it believes that, that there is somehow appropriate level of uncertainty and prediction error, which can be resolved by active inference. So such a uh, relationship between the surprise, I mean, prediction error that called the surprise and uncertainty can be uh, expressed by inverted U-shaped curve that called uncertainty weighted prediction error. <clears throat> Apply not only to rhythm, but also to musical chord progression. In this case, the peak of the inverted U-shaped corresponding to the situation where either uncertainty or surprise is, surprise is high and other is low. As an example, I generate a universal model of a music chord progress progression based on brain statist pre statistical predictive learning using a large corpus of pop music code. Then using this model, I created four types of code progression by manipulating both uncertainty surprise. For example, in pattern one, because both uncertainty surprise are consistently low across four chord sequences. Therefore, we can easily predict the four chord. Because it depends on the people, but I think that many people uh, is not surprised when you hear the this chord sequences. On the other hand, in pattern two, uncertainty and surprise are low until the third chord here, but at the fourth chord, only surprise increase while uncertainty remain low. Therefore, we will be certainly surprised when we hear fourth chord. You may be surprised, but you can um, um, consciously understand you were surprised, right? So with low uncertainty. On the other hand, in the pattern three, uncertainty and the surprise are low up to the third chord. This is the same, but at the fourth chord, only uncertainty increase while surprise remain low. This type chords leads to the uncertain prediction when we hear the third chord but we may be relieved when we actually heard the fourth chord because the fourth chord is less surprised. See? <clears throat> so when you hear the third chord, you will be a little bit um, um, kind of anxious. You can difficult to predict, but when you hear the fourth chord, you kind of resolve, oh, this is not surprising chord, right? <clears throat> so we created such a chord sequences. And in this uh, in this case, so peak of the inverted U-shaped uncertain weighted prediction error corresponds to this two pattern two or pattern three. <clears throat> such a uh, uh, for example, the functional MRI study, recent functional MRI study has reported that the brain reward system, reward system in the brain is activated during such chord sequences with um, these two types of chord sequences. So 
the question is how so my project is question of my project is how such a music prediction kind of uh, embodied U-shaped curve based prediction influence the embodied cognition of music. So, in, so to understand this, interestingly, the embodied cognition can be monitored through the bodily sensation map triggered by emotion. So recent studies suggest such a subjective body map uh, may be reflected in actual body physical uh, physical recording such as PET, uh, positron emission topo tomogra tomography, topogra tomography, heart rate, respiration, and so on. So very recent study reveals that the music emotion can also be monitored by such a bodily map. That is, whole body as well as brain function. So however, no study investigates uh, how fluctuation of the uncertainty or music uncertainty and the prediction error modulated this bodily map. So regarding this question, my recent study uh, utilizing a large corpus of music called progression, we have uh, so I, I generate the eight type of code sequences like the previous slide. So then participants were exposed to these eight type of code progression in random model. So following each listening session, they were asked to respond with click to position in the body where they fell, where they felt from the court uh, hearing using the body image presented on the screen. Then they were required to select the best five emotion category in ranking edited by each code. And then they an also answer the nine uh, Likert scale, Likert scale uh, of balance and arousal. So here are the results of the, my recent study. Interestingly, the, when both prediction error and uncertainty uh, were low, this in code progression, participants report a strong sensation, particularly in the abdomen position, st stomach position. Conversely, when learning the code progression with the uh, uh, fluctuation of predictability, where the surprise were high, but uncertainty were low, fitting in the peak point of inverted U curve, uh, participants showed the strong sensation, particularly around the heart area. This suggests that the embodied cognition of music where certain harmonic patterns are able to elicit distinct sensation in different parts of the body. So the interesting is that we also explore the intensity of uh, different emotions, certain to different emotion in response to each chord, like the best of five emotion. Using this emotional data, we examine whether there are unique emotional distribution structure, emotional structure for each code using TSNE analysis. The results suggest that the possibility of unique emotional distribution, emotional structure, multiple emotional structure for each code, <clears throat> indicating that the relative relationship of emotional structure in each code may explain subjective music experience. Furthermore, the findings imply that emotional structure may vary depending on whether physical sensations are strong or weak. The same color shows the same code sequences, but the circle is a uh, represents a strong heart sensation and uh, but the other signal is a weak heart rate sensation. So even this same code sequences, the emotional structure is different uh, depending on the interceptive, I mean, bodily sensation. So this suggests that the individual music emotion are deeply linked with the subject em embodied cognition. So the imp another important thing is that we analyze the directionality between sound and emotion and bodily sensation, essentially which element mediate, mediate the other using the mediation analysis. So my first hypothesis was that the music would elicit bottom-up rapidly bodily responses, which in turn would generate emotion. However, the results turned out differently. That is, that instead, it appeared that music evoked emotion first, and these emotions then act as a mediator to produce bodily sensation. This is kind of kanashika, nakukara kanashika, this kind of 
and so on. But the the main situation, but at least in this analysis study, this study shows this directionality. <clears throat> So based on these findings of my study, my project of core structure uh, tackled question about how sound auditory courier, not only music, structure, emerge and are uh, expressed through the embodiment and how cognitive individuality modulates sound courier and whether sound courier can be intentionally altered through the somatosensory stimulation. For example, our another uh, study investigates the body position and emotion felt by 2,000 participants when listening to sound of various frequency. These findings indicated that the highest audible range, like uh, 1,600 hertz, uh, pure tone, most people felt sensation at the top of their head, while at the lowest audible range, kind of 20 hertz to 30 hertz, rather than lower part of the body kind of food, many, uh, many people felt the sensation in the lower part of their internal organ, that is the interoceptive sensation around here. Regarding emotion, lower sounds were associated with the higher, uh, higher comfort and lower negative emotion. Then important thing is that individual with alexithymia or a severe depressive tendency who show a lower interoceptive sensation, is known the lower extensive sensation, experience the non-localized bodily sensation. You can see, yeah, bodily sensation. <clears throat> and increased negative emotion towards lower sounds. So this suggests that the cognitive individuality could alter the bodily map structure. Uh, which in turn may transform the structure of sound career. The interesting point of this, okay, it still have time, a little bit. So another interesting point of this study is that we also try to focus on the sounds that transcend, transcend the body. For example, something like, for, for example, sound produced by one, my own body, like thinking, thinking, th uh, thinking uh, a song can easily embody a strong sense of self-ownership, making them feel more personal. On the other hand, something like sublime sound um, from nature, like vol volcanic eruption and sounds that express something like God may evoke the sense of awe and kind of a transcendence, leaving that transcend, transcendent bodily sensation that one cannot uh, possess uh, by my own, something like this. It's a kind of mister. I think this is kind of trans embodied. It's just my hypothesis. So such a trans embodied sound can give life to higher the emotion and aesthetic sensations such as sublimity and kind of creativity that go beyond the basic emotion. So my hypothesis is that while embodiment imposes a certain constraint on perception, enriching the cognition, it's the emergence of this trans, trans bodily sensation uh, fulfilling uh, yet surpassing the body frame, bodily frame that leads to more aesthetic career. This research seeks to understand that the structure of sound career based on also trans embodied bodily map as well as body map within the body. Okay, so this is a current status. So we have already started a pilot study with uh, Keske san and Hori san involving 2,000 participants to understand how body map of music varies through as the lifespan from birth to old age. I actually record the, from the six age and until the 99 years old. <laughs> so that is um, to understand cognitive individuality based on development and aging. The current results indicate that the heart and stomach sensation evoked by music tend to peak and localize around age 20s. 
and gradually diminishing and diffused uh, thereafter. So these findings are based on the participant age over 15, and we are now analyzing the before 20 years and after 80 years. Thank you very much. That's all for, from my presentation. Okay, thanks, uh, Gokusan. So thank you for the, your presentation for us. And uh, let's move to the QA session. And if you have any question comment, please yeah, ask. And uh, yeah, uh, Liang san please. Oh, hello, um, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I have a question regarding uh, your use of emotion uh, mm -hmm. term. So uh, I'm wondering if you make a differentiation between um, the emotion that the music is trying to express, you know, in the way that you ask, you show participant the piece of music, and then you ask them, uh, what do you think the, the emotion of the music is? Yeah. And there's another type of emotion where it's the emotion they experience when listening to the music. Do you it's make sorry. a... So it, you mean the episodic one? Sorry, what's the difference? The first uh, emotion, the second emotion, second type of emotion. So you, you, you look at the second type of emotion. So my pre previous study, I, I think if I'm correctly understanding that I now record the first emotion, just after hearing, after, after listening to the music chords, just I ask to the participant how you felt from these chord sequences. That's all, that's all, yeah. I see. Because I, I feel like um, because you investigate how emotion mediates people's bodily maps to the music, I feel like if people actually um, oh. resonate with the music, and feel the emotion, like I feel sad listening to the sad music, then maybe there will be stronger, um, yeah, a stronger bodily reaction to it compared to just like, oh, what do you think this music is about? And then we, oh, it's happy music. But, um, you know, it's, I actually, yeah, feel, okay, yeah, I understand what you mean. I mean, that you, that this type of question will, uh, some kind of influence the body map, I mean, the body sensation, because if, if they ask the oh, happy music, they already cut, music is already categorized as a happy music, then this influence the embodiment, right? Mm -hmm. So if they actually feel happy, then the embodiment will be stronger in a sense, because they become- Yeah, yeah, that, that's, yeah, okay. Yeah, so the, this is a very important question, and I, the, my reviewer of the paper also criticized this ordering. So, firstly, the question is that firstly, I ask to the participants the body map without any uh, emotion. Just say how, where you feel, felt, you you feel, participants feel the, what, where the, you feel from the body in the body. Just ask, and then after that, say. I ask to the emotion, but well, this is not the correct, uh, complete answering, but the ordering is the first body map and then emotion in each music. But they already know how they will be asked after hearing the music. That's why they are, I, I think they interact with each other, influence each other, as you say. Yeah. And the music pieces you use were uh, the chords? At the moment, yes. Uh, my previous study is only chords, but uh, my project from this, this project, I'm going to use the more uh, uh, more ab abstract sounds, something like the Misa that I presented, and volcano sound, and many nature sound. Uh, uh, yeah. OK, got it. Thank you very much. Thank you for the question. Then I'll ask a kind of follow-up question. Uh, so probably part of the Kianshin's question was that uh, uh, by emotion here in the center, you are not mm -hmm. uh, discriminating or considering the possibility of the dissociation or uh, 
non-correlation between the emotional responses versus emotional experience, mm. right? Mm. Because you don't really directly ask the experience. Yeah, yeah. Like, you know, in uh, maybe, maybe you, you want to ask a question, but uh, we, we can probably ask like a similarity of the felt emotion about this particular music versus, uh, versus another music. That's mm. a direct, more direct kind of, you know, probe onto the emotional experience. Mm, mm, but, uh, yeah. You are kind of the inferring from the body map sort of the response that uh, where this emotional response happened, right? In terms of localization, it's you. You're yeah. not really asking the quality of the emotional experience. Yes, 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 yes. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I I think that's that would be interesting to ask. Uh, I don't know whether you're gonna include it. Sorry, yeah. That's that's true. Yeah. Thank you very much for a very good uh, comment. I I think I I'm going to uh, consider the next uh, study to understand this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, so, uh, thank you, Sam. Yeah, please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much for your very interesting talks. So, now, uh, could you go back to the uh, slide showing, uh, comparing that four code progressions? Code yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe, but it was okay. So, that, yeah, actually, as a hobby, I love writing songs and composing music, and I have been always wondering what is the basis of the theory of code progressions. It's a kind of, it's very mysterious. So, and uh, to, my, to my understanding, does this mean that the theory of code progression can be explained from the viewpoint of bodily sensations? Then also the, uh, I'm curious about why some typical code progression brings about such a type of high kind of specific the bodily sensations. Maybe the, it's a kind of the pause and uh, effect relationships. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Tanji. And uh, um, I'm happy to talk with you the day before yesterday. Um, I think that, that it's not my study, but the previous studies they, uh, also analyzed uh, all of the classical music, uh, or the pr probabilistic distribution of all of the, uh, I mean, music, classical music, and they understand that the uh, uh, Western classical music theory can be represented by probabilistic distribution as well. So that's why the mm -hmm. high probability is kind of based on, strictly mm -hmm. based on the music theory. Of course, it is not, not so surprising, but then in, in that case, so this type A is the, actually the strictly uh, follows the music theory, mm -hmm. right? And right. for example, this H sound, this is uh, strictly disrupts the music theory because the uncertainty, the surprise, is very high. Sorry, this is not. Uh, I mean, take the different. This one. This is the. Uh, <laughs> always low probability code of sequences. Then in that case, the body map is a little bit different because mm -hmm. I think that I cannot express in English, but I think that, that if the code of sequence is based on the music theory, they felt the stomach uh, sensation. It's kind of funi mm -hmm. uh, or hara ochisuru, <laughs> not tuksuru, something like that. But then high if it's disrupted, they will surprise that then I think that they felt more strongly to the uh, cardiac sensation rather than the stomach sensation. This is my current <laughs> thinking. I mean, it's, mm. it's I, I, yeah, right. You mean the kind of the prob probability distribution is a kind of a statistical one. So the, yeah. that's a kind of habit only a kind of the cultural habit. Yes, yes. yes so yes. the cultural habit comes first or bodily sensation comes first to uh, make you culture, mm. culture emerge. 
Yeah, well, this is very important. I think that, I mean, the Western music theory is actually cultural music theory mm -hmm. <laughs> based on the Western side. And But for example, Japanese music, something like the uh, Hogaku, mm -hmm. Gagaku, mm -hmm. this is completely different from the music theory, mm -hmm. Western music theory. So of course that they, and the Amazon, as I said in the first presentation, for example, that they like to hear the dissonance rather than consonance. It's, it's the opposite to the, Western people, they like the mm. Western people like the concept. That's why it's also depending on the culture and experience, how what kind of music they have heard mm. during the development. That's why, yeah, it, it's just uh, it. I cannot even uh, generalize this. Mm. Generalize this literature. Yeah, it's very interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, are there any question comment from the audience? Oh, okay. So, yeah, it's just sounds please, please. Um, hi, um, great talk. I just wonder whether um, this uh, surprise and uncertainty can also apply to more naturalistic uh, sound stimuli. I think it makes a lot of sense when we're talking about music um, because someone has sort of designed a rhythm that uh, was in this music and we see these embodied cognition. But uh, you also mentioned uh, things like the sound of volcan uh, volcano eruption. Mm. And I just wonder whether the same applies to these naturalistic sounds. Mm. In particular question. So this is uh, actually one of the difficult <laughs> uh, things that I'm now thinking of to how, how these kind of findings can be connected with the naturalistic uh sounds like volcano i mean i i think i cannot explain from the prediction actually uh if i use the uh, nature naturalistic sound uh, oh, yeah not uh, some some kind I, I can explain but i don't want to explain just from the prediction if i use the such a naturalistic sound i i'm now thinking that another type of hypothesis uh, basic hypothesis to understand relationship with the naturalistic sound and bodily map. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, hi, thank you for your presentation. For this, this, um, this body map, I'm curious, can you calculate the difference between uh, like a high uncertainty and a low uncertainty then calculate the difference between two body map and then to visualize the uncertainty in the body map? Is that possible or? Yes. I think, yeah, I, I think completely it's possible uh, to compare just between the high answer, the low answer data, of course. Um, yeah, but I haven't done it yet, yeah. Yeah, because I'm a little bit curious about um, if you can separate each components individually, and then, yes, I'm curious about this. Uh, it's just a comment, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, um, Daiko Chan. I just have one question. Uh, yeah. It's very interesting that the intensity of uh, bodily map is very localized, say, in people uh, aged 20, 20 years old, and it's very diffuse right. in old age. I'm just wondering what if in another, in another um, sample, say, uh, musicians who are very trained with uh, music notes, uh, will the connection between um, will the connection between emotions and uh, the uncertainty mm -hmm. and surprise be intensified? Yeah. <laughs> well, actually, I have uh, uh, analyzed. I mean, I also ask the music experience, and I com compare the low music education and high music education, but they have no. Uh, results rather than they have no differences. Rather than this, I, the strong differences can be found in the individual between uh, individual with high interceptive sensation and low interceptive sensation. Kind of sensitivity of interception is more important rather than music education. This is current findings. Uh, okay. yeah. 
Thank you very much. Makes sense. Okay, the uh, Ito san is go ahead, and I think it's a uh, last question. Uh, hello, uh, Daikok san. Uh, thank you for your interesting talk. Uh, I was very interested uh, by your research uh, project because I study synesthesia, and I felt that the, the body map, the, the phenomenon, had some resemblance to synesthesia, auditory, sensory type of synesthesia. Mm -hmm. But uh, are you kind of, uh, you, your hypothesis uh, showed, uh, assumed that sound evokes emotion and then em emotion uh, induces bodily sensations. But in synesthesia, you wouldn't usually assume that emotion mediates the, the, the two phenomena. Yes. The, the, the association is more direct. So yeah. uh, my question is, do you think your the body map phenomenon is a type of synesthesia? And if so, and if not, how is it different? How is it similar? I, I would like to uh, hear your yeah. uh, thoughts on that. Thank you very much for the very interesting question. I mean, actually, I have I mean, the, it's not my study. You know, my recent previous study also uh, studies uh, synesthesia uh, and the body map. And well, but but uh, anyway, my thinking is that this type of body map, kind of music code sequences body map, is not completely. I mean, it's not strongly related with the synesthesia because that this is more interception. I think. Uh, in, yeah, conscious interception. But the study with uh, Horizon, previous study with Horizon, this is uh, just a pitch. Uh, I just present a pitch lower, from lower pitch to higher pitch, and they show the lower pitch is a uh, low body and higher pitch is uh, the uh, high body. This is completely, I think, the synesthetic uh, uh, type of the synesthetic <laughs> phenomena. And then this kind of relationship i mean it's not the interception it's kind of proprioception i guess and this proprioception is that this diffuse in the some kind of cognitive individuality i think this is can be or sh should be also discussed in the synesthesia uh, actually that that's why i i but i think that more music uh stimuli and the more basic pitch stimuli is different phenomena even in the bo same body map Maybe uh, it's it's like the difference between cross modal association and synesthesia. If you say cross modal association, you refer to lower level sensations associated with uh, like like more vague sensations, high or low, and yeah. the association is not idiosyncratic; it's universal. So yeah. there yeah. some kind of those kinds of difference between uh, the body map phenomena when you when you use uh, natural sounds and stimuli. Or music, yeah. Maybe maybe you it's, be yeah. looking at different different phenomena, different right, levels. Yeah, yeah. Very I interesting. Think. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. And it's time to stop the the talk. And so thank you for the Daikokusan and this. Uh, thank you for the audience for discussion. Thank you. And I think so that today's the uh Zoom the talk from the uh Hobohan in our core structure is already done. So Tsuchi-san, do you have any kind of the like, information or announcement? I, I forgot uh, what which one is the next one. So I'll uh, make a proper <laughs> announcement either in uh, Slack or uh, Twitter or somewhere. Okay. So see you next time. Okay, yeah, I think so. That from the YouTube uh, audience, so you can see the, our channel to the find the next the this kind of the talk. Yeah, please check it. Okay. And thank you for joining the today's the meeting. And again, so we uh, cropped our hand for the today's presenter. Thank you so very much. And see you next time. See you. See you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.